Hi, I'm Fry. And I'm Bree from Pontifax, a papal history podcast where we are ranking the popes from Peter to Francis. And Ryan has very kindly given us the opportunity to introduce the latest episode of the History of Ancient Greece and to tell you a little bit about our show. In each episode, we go over the life, contributions, scandal, appearance, and interesting unknowns of a single pope, and then we rank them based on our very serious categories. In the end, our best popes will battle it out to be the popiest pope to ever pope and take the keys of the pearly gates from St. Peter. In this episode of Thoag, Ryan is going to be talking about omens in the ancient Greek world. So it's only fitting that we tell you one of the greatest papal stories about omens, which is when Pope Calixtus III excommunicated Halley's Comet to counteract its evil omen on the impending siege of Belgrade. The whole comet? Yep, it's been excommunicated. It can't come to church? Nope. Before we get into it, it is important to note that this story has categorically been proven to be untrue, but it has been tied to the Pope pretty much since his own time, and can be sourced back to a contemporary, and it has stuck. So it's exactly the kind of bonkers stories we love at Pontifax. So here we go. In June and early July, 1456, Halley's Comet appeared over Rome. And this could have easily been interpreted as an omen. You know, unusual events in the heavens marking unusual and dangerous events on Earth. Like you do. And sure enough, on July 4th, Belgrade was surrounded by the Turkish forces of Sultan Mehmed II. Now, on June 29th, Pope Calixtus issued a papal bull to have the church bells rung three times in the afternoon, with special processions to follow to extol the cruelty of the Turks and to pay for the Christians who are fighting against them. Notably, Halley's Comet disappeared on July 8th, and the Turks were defeated on July 22nd. Now, this is where it gets weird because it's a contemporary of Calixtus, Bartolomeo Platina, wrote about this moment for his text, The Lives of the Popes. And in his account, he suggests that the bull for the bells and prayers was to avert the wrath of God, which over time turned into attempting to frighten the comment away and to shift the ill effects of the bad omen towards the heretic enemy. And this story is the one that sticks. And the inference carries all the way to the 18th century, where astronomer Pierre Simon, Marquise de Laplace, makes it worse, writing in his account that Calixtus issued a papal bull to exorcise the comet, and Francis Arago becomes the first person to cite that Calixtus issued an excommunication to the comet. This myth has stuck for so long that even Carl Sagan cited it in his book. Oh, that's that's far. What does Neil deGrasse Titan say about it? He says it's categorically untrue. Oh, he would. He's so to the point. So this has gotten so entrenched in the history of both the papacy and Halley's Comet that in 1907, the Vatican Press released a 40-page document written by one of the leading experts at the Vatican Observatory to disprove this story citing that while they had access to more ecclesiastical documents than anyone else living, there was no evidence of a papal bull to excommunicate the comet, no actual mention or allusion of the comet in the bull, and the bull actually issued was invoked before the siege of Belgrade. So can we please give this story a rest? This is what they're asking. But it's so funny. It's a great story, and this is just one of many ridiculous stories that we'll be covering on Pontifax, so you should join us. You can find Pontifax at pontifax.podbean.com and all major podcatching services. That's P-O-N-T-I-F-A-C-T-S. Pontifax. And now with that, please enjoy the history of ancient Greece.
Hello, my name's Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. Episode 81, Orphism, Omens, and Oracles. During the 6th century BC, in addition to the social and political movements among the masses in various parts of Greece, there was also an intellectual and spiritual dissatisfaction with the traditional religion of Homer and Hesiod, and their explanation of the origin of the world. We've already encountered the natural philosophy of Thales and his successors in Ionia, and how that came into being in episode 20. Well, there was also a moral dissatisfaction with the tales of religious mythology, as they were handed down by the epic bards. And this led to many interpreting and modifying various aspects of the gods, in order to make them conform to ethical ideals. Further than this, life was hard, particularly for the unprivileged masses, and so the ancient Greeks increasingly began to feel a craving for a better existence after death an intense curiosity about the world of the shades, and a desire for personal contact with the supernatural. Both the scientific and the religious movements have the same objective, to solve the mystery of existence, but the religious craving demanded a short road and immediate satisfaction. This craving thus led to the propagation of three new popular religious cults, where Attica became its most active center. We already discussed the first two, the Cult of Dionysus in episode 55, and the Eleusinian Mysteries in episode 62. Well, the other one yet to be discussed is Orphism, or the Orphic Mysteries. Based partly on the wild Thracian worship of Dionysus, this religion was called Orphic after the legendary Greek hero Orpheus, who tradition says was also born in Thrace, and who founded the Bacchic Rites. Orphism exercised a deep influence over not only the people at large, but even the thinkers of Greece, and Orphic teachers devised an elaborate theology of their own, a special doctrine with peculiar rites and rules of conduct, but also including many of the old traditional beliefs. The Orphic religion thus can be described as being based on three institutions, the worship of Dionysus, the Eleusinian mysteries connected with the gods of the underworld, and the itinerant seers. But these three in their own right also acquired new significance in the light of Orphic theology. Orpheus was said to be the son of a Thracian king named Oeagrus, as well as Calliope, who was one of the muses. In particular, she was the muse who presides over eloquence and epic poetry, and who Hesiod and Ovid labeled as the chief of all the muses. Orpheus met Apollo while living with his mother and her eight beautiful sisters, the other muses, on Mount Parnassus at Delphi. As the god of music, Apollo taught Orpheus how to play the lyre, and his mother taught him to make verses for singing. Although he was a pupil of Apollo, he also was a devotee of Dionysus and his worship. He comes from Thrace in northern Greece, and thus is often depicted wearing the more exotic clothes of those people. According to the traditional stories, he was so marvelous as a musician that when he sang and played his lyre, the wild Thracians became gentle as they listened to him, and even trees uprooted and rivers and stones came to listen to his music. According to some traditions, Linus was Orpheus' brother as well. Some ancient authors even suggest that Apollo was the father of both, and not Oeagrus. Because like Orpheus, Linus was a reputed musician and the master of eloquent speech. He was regarded as the first leader of lyric song, and was the music teacher whom the teenage Heracles later killed out of frustration, as we discussed in episode 47. Orpheus had many adventures in his early days. In particular, he joined the Argonauts on their voyage to retrieve the Golden Fleece, and supposedly, with his music, he was able to calm the waves in a storm and calm the crew whenever they became unruly. Some versions of the myth say that it was Orpheus who lulled the dragon to sleep so that Jason could grab the Golden Fleece, and not Medea with her magic. Also, when the Argonauts were sailing by the sirens, whose beautiful voices lured passing sailors to come to them, which resulted in the crashing of their ships into the rocky islands, Orpheus drew his lyre and sang even more beautifully, thus drowning out the sirens' bewitching songs and keeping the men at their oars. On his return to Thrace, he lived in a cave and spent his time taming the countryside with his music. This shows that the Greeks connected a knowledge of music with the very existence of social order. It controls the passions, pleases the gods, requires discipline, and therefore was a fitting pursuit for young men in the city. 
It also shows that the Greeks believed the people of Thrace were barbarians, who needed to be introduced to order and civilization. Orpheus was set to marry a girl whom he loved passionately, whose name was Eurydice. But when the wedding day came, many dreadful things happened. Hymen, or Hymenios, was one of the winged love gods, called the Erotes, and was the god of marriage feasts and songs. In particular, the song sung during the procession of the bride to the groom's house. And so, although the god Hymen came to the wedding, which was always a good sign, he couldn't keep a sacred wedding torch lit. No matter how much he shook it and tried to light it, it just produced a smoke that irritated the eyes of the guests and made them cry. This was obviously an ominous sign, and on that very day, Eurydice was assaulted and pursued through the meadows by Aristeus, who lusted after her greatly. He was the husband of Ateno, and the father of Actaeon from the royal house of Thebes. These family connections, it should be noted, bring Orpheus into even closer contact with the stories of Dionysus. Other sources say that it was a satyr. Regardless, in Eurydice's haste to escape Aristeus, she ran through a nest of poisonous snakes. One of them bit her on the heel, and she died almost immediately from its venom. Her body was discovered by Orpheus, and he was so overwhelmed with inconsolable grief that he ceased to sing and play his music, but moped around in silence. Finally, when he did play, it was such sad and mournful songs that all of the nymphs and gods wept. And so feeling pity for him, they convinced him to go to the underworld and seek permission from Hades and Persephone in order to bring his beloved Eurydice back. Like many, if not all, of the major heroes of the ancient Greeks, Orpheus descended into the underworld and returned. This is always a symbol that the hero conquered death, something that the ordinary human could never accomplish. Orpheus found an entrance to the underworld in southern Italy. Once he arrived, he began to play his lyre, and in doing so, he charmed the ferryman Chiron and the guard dog Cerberus, and so they let him pass. All of the shades of the underworld were also entranced by his music, so much so that even the tortures of Tartarus stopped while he was playing. The symbolism of the power of his music to save men from the black, dank realm of hopelessness and death inspired many poets to linger over this part of the story. For example, Ovid hints that his music could even release the guilty from the punishment of their sins, and Virgil, in his Georgics, extends upon this by making every corner of the underworld respond to Orpheus' song. Even the hearts of Hades and Persephone were softened by his music. In making his case, Orpheus told them how Eurydice died before her time, how eventually they still would have her one day, and that he wouldn't return without her. Hades and Persephone were so charmed by his music that they agreed to let him recover Eurydice and take her back, but with one condition. Orpheus must lead the way out of the underworld and not look back at her until they reach the upper world. He agreed and the two of them departed, his wife behind him with his eyes fixed ahead. But while he was leading her through the steep path and black vapors back to the upper world, just as the end of the passage was in sight and the light was visible ahead, he could not refrain from turning and gazing at his wife's face. He was worried whether she was safe or really even there. Perhaps he had heard her stumble and instinctually looked back. Regardless, at that very moment, she turned into a mist, a shade of her former self again. And though he grabbed at her, she was sucked back down into the underworld. He tried to follow after her, but this time his music failed him. After losing Eurydice for a second time, the heartbroken Orpheus became like a lost soul on earth, wandering here and there living like a recluse and avoiding the company of everyone, but above all, of women. He would sing, but they were songs of mourning and lament. The women he came across resented his utter devotion to a wife that had passed away, because he was so handsome and shunned them all away. In fact, according to tradition, he was turned off by women so much that the Greeks believed him to be the originator of the practice of older men having relations with younger boys. He was enjoying, as the ancient authors wrote, quote, the brief spring of their youth and plucking its first flowers, end quote. Persephone, of course, was picking flowers when she was dragged off by Hades, and so the imagery of flowers has deep sexual symbolism in Greek myth. Anyways, Orpheus also disdained the worship of all gods except the sun, whom he called Apollo. 
One morning, when he went to worship his sun god at dawn on Mount Pangaeon, he stumbled upon a group of maenads who were performing the ecstatic rites in honor of Dionysus. When they saw him, they went into a frenzy and flew after him. Their weapons, though, were charmed by his music and fell to the ground around him. The women, as a result, grew more hostile and bold, abandoning all restraint. As they began to play their Dionysic music, the curved pipes, the pounding drums, and the shrieking screams eventually drowned out his lyre. During the frenzy of their Bacchic orgy, they managed to catch him and tear him to shreds. In fact, there seems to be some confusion between this story and that of Pentheus, who saw the rites of Dionysus and was torn apart also. Some authors have Dionysus angry at Orpheus as well, first for rejecting him and then for spying on his worshippers, but others have him punishing the Maenads for harming his devotee. In either case, as the Maenads tore him apart, his head rolled down the hill into the river Hebrus and was washed down to the Aegean, rolling this way and that and constantly crying out for Eurydice. There, the winds and waves carried him eventually to the island of Lesbos, where the people buried it, erecting a shrine and an oracle to this detached talking head. In addition to the people of Lesbos, Greeks from Ionia and Aetolia consulted this oracle, and his reputation spread even as far as Babylon. From then onwards, the Lesbians became great poets. Remember Sappho? The Muses are said to have gathered his fragments and buried them at Dion, near Mount Olympus where a nightingale sang over his tomb. His lyre was placed in the heavens by Zeus as a constellation and a favor to Calliope. Orpheus's soul returned to the underworld, where he was reunited at last with his beloved Eurydice. There are many ways to understand and interpret the Orpheus myth. One part of the story that especially drew attention from ancient writers was his exit from the underworld, where he lost his wife for a second time. This episode was significant because in doing so, Orpheus witnessed the process of regeneration, and so he knew and saw too much. It is for this reason, probably, that Orpheus became a fitting figure to build a cult around. We don't know how it began, but by the 6th century BC, the name of Orpheus was at the center of a set of religious beliefs and practices, called Orphism. He wasn't mentioned in Homer and Hesiod, but first appears in a fragment by the lyric poet Ibicus. Most ancient sources accepted his historical existence, with Aristotle being the lone exception. Orphix also revered Persephone, who annually descended into the underworld for a season and then returned, and Dionysus, who also descended and returned just once. Apollodorus, for example, states that Orpheus invented the mysteries of Dionysus. Regardless, Dionysus was central to Orphism, usually under the name Zagreus, and it has been speculated that the Orphic mystery cult regarded Orpheus as a parallel figure to, or even an incarnation of Dionysus. Both made similar journeys into the underworld, and Dionysus Zagreus suffered an identical death. The myth of Eurydice, though, may actually be a late addition to the Orpheus story. In particular, the name Eurydice, which literally means she whose justice extends widely, recalls cultic titles attached to Persephone. Furthermore, the mythic symbolism of not looking back can also be seen in the biblical story of Lot's wife, who turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. More directly, the story of Orpheus is similar to the ancient Greek tales of Persephone being captured by Hades, and similar stories of Adonis being held captive in the underworld. However, the Orpheus myth, as it developed, became entwined with the Orphic mystery cults, and later in Rome with the development of Mithraism and the cult of Sol Invectus. Over time, the myths surrounding the hero Orpheus accrued numerous variations in their details at the hands of diverse groups of people. In particular, the imagery of the story of this musical hero, Orpheus played the lyre in the Cathara, which he invented, with all of its symbolism, was used by esoteric religious movements to advance their doctrines, and by poets to claim a certain religious authority. As an allegory, it even makes its way into early Christian iconography. In the catacombs, for example, Jesus Christ appears at times in the guise of Orpheus with a lyre. In some Christian tombs, Orpheus is depicted delivering the Sermon on the Mount or acting as the Good Shepherd. 
The Greeks recognized, especially, that music has a mystical quality to the extent that it can hold influence over the soul and purify it of its evil, harmful elements, even resurrecting it when it's at the point of death. In the cults of Sibylle and Dionysus, music is used to stir the soul into a frenzy so that you can reach ecstasis or ecstasy, which is the proper state to be able to receive the God and to be in touch with one's inner self. It literally means to be or stand outside oneself, and is a common term used in ancient Greek, Christian, and existential philosophy. Orpheus, though, did not use music this way, but to entrance and calm. In the underworld, for example, he tried to use his harmonies to raise his dead wife and to exert influence over the shades, which makes us think of Jesus' harrowing of hell and conquest of death as well. Among the Jews, Orpheus sometimes appears, not surprisingly, as King David, the forerunner of the Anointed One who would bring salvation and eternal life in the Jewish and Christian tradition. David played the lyre too and wrote psalms. Today, we still believe in the healing power of music, or music therapy, which acknowledges that music can affect the human psyche in some profound way. There has come down to us a body of literature that has been ascribed to Orpheus himself, but of course it's not really his. This literature, known as the Orphic Hymns, was originally a collection of hymns, poems, and commentaries, but only two have managed to survive, though they date to much later in the 2nd century AD and beyond. It is believed that there was earlier Orphic literature that dates as far back as the 6th century BC, but it no longer survives, besides a few fragments. Distinctively Orphic views and practices are attested as early as the classical period, though, in the works of Herodotus, Euripides, and Plato. Also, there is graffiti of the 5th century BC that refers to a group of people as the Orphics. Classical sources, such as Plato, refer to these people as Orpheo Telestai, or Orpheus Initiates, as well as their associated rites, although how far the Orphic literature related to these rites is not certain. It's probably likely that Orphic poetry was recited in certain mystery rites and purification rituals. Plato, in particular, tells of a class of itinerant beggar priests who would go about offering purifications to the rich with a clatter of books by Orpheus and Musaeus in hand. Thanks to the Orphic hymns, we know that the main elements of Orphism differed from traditional ancient Greek religion in three ways. By characterizing human souls as divine and immortal, but doomed to live, for a period, in a grievous circle of successive bodily lives through metempsychosis, or the transmigration of souls. By prescribing an ascetic way of life, which, together with secret initiation rites, was supposed to guarantee not only individual release from the grievous circle, but also communion with the gods, and by being founded upon sacred writings about the origin of gods and human beings. Those who were specially devoted to these rituals and poems often practiced abstention from sex and vegetarianism, refraining especially from eating eggs and beans, all of which came to be known as the Orphikos Bios, or the Orphic Way of Life. In addition, archaeologists recovered in 1962 what is known as the Derveni Papyrus, since it was found in Derveni, a city in what was ancient Macedon. It contains a philosophical treatise in hexameter that is an allegorical commentary on an Orphic poem, as a theogony concerning the birth of the gods, originally produced in the circle of the philosopher Anaxagoras in the second half of the 5th century BC. We will discuss Anaxagoras more in a future episode. The papyrus dates to around 340 BC, during the reign of Philip II of Macedon, making it Europe's oldest surviving manuscript. And so, thanks to the papyrus, we know quite a bit about Orphic theogony. While it is similar to Hesiod's theogony, as they told relatively the same stories about the birth of the gods and the creation of humans, the details are somewhat different. In this, we can see that the Orphic teachers promulgated a new theory of the creation of the world, a theory which may have derived somewhat from Babylon. Their theogony runs like this. They taught that Kronos, or time, was the original or first principle, sometimes described as a monstrous serpent having the heads of a bull and a lion with a god's face between them. Kronos was accompanied by a brooding adrastia, or necessity, and from Kronos came Aether, Chaos, and Erebus. In Aether, Cronus fashioned a shining egg that split into two, and from this appeared the firstborn of all of the gods and the god of light, Thanes. 
He was called by many names, among them Eros, or love, and Protogonos, or firstborn. Phanes itself means the one who manifests, or the revealer, and it is related to the Greek words for light and to shine forth, as well as the Latin Lucifer. The cosmic egg that Phanes was hatched from was known as the Orphic egg, and it is often depicted with a serpent wound around it. He was a hermaphroditic deity, with gleaming golden wings and four eyes, and was typically described as possessing the appearance of various animals. Phanes, as the god of light, was the creator of everything, including all of the other gods, as well as mankind. He bore a daughter, Nyx, or Night, who became his partner in creation and eventually a successor in power. Nyx then bore Gaia and Oranos, and they produced the Titans. Next, Kronos, spelled with a kappa, and not a chi, like the previous one, succeeded to power over the gods and subsequently, as in Hesiod, his power was wrested away by his son Zeus. Then Zeus swallowed Phanes, and with him, all previous creation, including a special race of human beings of a golden age. Zeus then created everything anew, with the help of Nyx. As a second creator god, Zeus became the beginning, middle, and end of all things. Eventually, Zeus made it with Kor, or Persephone, and Dionysus was born, in his incarnation as Zagreus. This closely connected him with the underworld, and Zeus proclaimed him his heir to the throne. Hera was jealous of the child, and so she convinced the Titans to attack Dionysus. After many escapes, at one point he took the form of a bull, but the Titans managed to find him. They then tore him apart and began to eat him. But Athena saved the heart of Dionysus just in time, and then told Zeus of the crime. While they were still wet with the blood of their victim, Zeus struck the Titans down with a thunderbolt, and human beings were born out of their ashes and from the evil of the Titans. Zeus gave the heart of Dionysus to Semele, who swallowed it, a symbolic representation of him impregnating her, and Dionysus was born again, a literal rebirth, or twice born. In another version, Dionysus is implanted into the thigh of Zeus, and then reborn. Many of the details differ in the accounts and the classical authors, but we can see that the traditional myth of Zeus, Semele, and Dionysus are there in some form. Regardless, from then onwards, humans had their original evil side, from their original sin, and a good side, coming from Dionysus, whose heart Semele had swallowed. Dionysus, the Orphics believed, could intercede on humans' behalf with his mother, Persephone, who was angry at the children of the Titans. The motive of the myth is to awaken in the human soul a consciousness of its divine origin and help it on its way back to the divine state. The soul of man, the Dionysus part, is therefore divine, but the body, the Titan part, holds the soul in bondage. For the Orphics, the goal was to try to purify oneself of one's Titan, meaning his or her monstrous self, in favor of one's Dionysic self. This ultimately required several lifetimes and steps of purity, reincarnation, special incantations, and charms, before you are ready to escape the cycle and live in the Isle of the Blessed with the other pure souls. In the intervals between these incarnations, which recur at fixed times, the soul exists in the kingdom of Hades. To attain a final deliverance, you must live ascetically to rules which the Orphics prescribed and be initiated into the orgies of Dionysus. Since the Orphics taught a life of asceticism, or self-denial, This eventually led them to be ridiculed. Included was vegetarianism, as they emphasized the sanctity of life and the need to keep yourself free of blood and murder because of the transmigration of souls. After all, that cow you might be eating could have been a person in their former life. They dressed in white and practiced frequent ceremonies of purifications. They professed a creed and taught the doctrine of judgment after death with rewards and punishments in Hades according to one's deeds in the body, and as in the Eleusinian mysteries, initiation into Orphic mysteries promise advantages in the afterlife. And so the Orphics believed that they were reintroducing the Thracian version of Dionysus into Greece, who to them now seemed almost like another god compared to the Dionysus who had been Hellenized and sobered since his admission into the society of the Greek gods of Olympus. They adopted and developed the ideas of the Eleusinian mysteries, and in a poem on the descent of Orpheus into Hades, they described the geography of the underworld. 
They also aspired to take the place of the old prophets and purifiers, and they sought out and collected the oracles which those prophets had disseminated. Their doctrines were published in poems which were intended to supersede the theogony of Hesiod, and the surviving fragments of these works arguably show more poetical power than the compositions of the successors of Homer. The Orphic religion found a welcome home at Athens and was encouraged by Pisistratus and his sons. In particular, Onomacritus, who was one of the most eminent Orphic teachers and the supposed author of a poem on the rites of initiation, was held in high esteem and had great influence at the court of the tyrants. If you recall, we mentioned in episode 26 how he was said to have taken part in preparing an official edition of Homer's epic poems, in which it was suspected that he and his collaborators inserted lines that had not previously been there. One of these changes led to his banishment when he was detected in making an addition of his own to a collection of ancient oracles, which were ascribed to the mythical poet Musaeus. The Orphic doctrines were also taken up by Pythagoras of Samos, which we discussed in episode 20. And so we see that Orphic views and practices have parallels to elements of Pythagoreanism. There is, however, too little evidence to determine the extent to which one movement may have influenced the other. Regardless, at the time of the fall of the Pythagoreans, the Orphic religion was still not adhered to by a majority of ancient Greeks. If those doctrines had taken firm hold of Greece, all of the priesthoods of the national temples would have admitted the new religion, become its ministers, and thereby exercise an enormous sacerdotal power. Orphism did not have a powerful antidote to counteract its mysticism. Even small as it was, they exercised a permanent influence, stimulating the imagination of poets like Aeschylus and Pindar, and diffusing a vivid picture of the world of Hades, which has affected all subsequent literature. Surviving written fragments show a number of beliefs about Dionysus' death, resurrection, and the afterlife, similar to those found in the Orphic mythology. Several inscribed bone tablets found in Olbia, dating to the 5th century BC, carry short and enigmatic inscriptions like, quote, Life, Death, Life, Truth, Dionysus, Orphix, end quote. The function of these bone tablets is unknown, though. Totenpasa is a German term that is sometimes used to identify inscribed tablets or gold leaves found in burials, primarily of those presumed to be initiates into Orphic, Dionysic, and some Egyptian and Semitic religions. The term may be roughly translated in English as a passport for the dead. The so-called Orphic prayer tablets are perhaps the best known example of these, and they have been found in graves from Thurai, Hipponium, Thessaly, and Crete, dating to the 4th century BC and after. In particular, the burial site of a woman in Thessaly, dating to the late 4th century BC, yielded a pair in the form of thin gold-leafed sheets. They are now housed at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Although the term leaf to describe metal foil is a modern metaphorical usage, these were, in this case, cut in the shape of leaves, probably meant to represent ivy, while most totempasa are rectangular. The Greek lettering is not inscribed in regular lines, as it has done so on the rectangular tablets, but rambles here to fit the shape. The leaves are paper thin and small, measuring roughly one by one and a half inches. In general, totempasa were placed on or near the body, or they were rolled and inserted into a capsule, often worn around the neck as an amulet. In this particular case, they had been arranged symmetrically on the woman's chest, with her lips sealed by a gold coin or Chiron's oval, that pays the ferryman of the dead for passage. This particular coin depicted the head of a gorgon. Also placed in the tomb was a terracotta figurine of a maenad, one of the ecstatic women in the retinue of Dionysus. The inscriptions on Totempasa instruct the initiate on how to navigate the afterlife, including directions for avoiding hazards in the landscape of the dead, and formulaic responses to the underworld judges. Although these thin tablets are often highly fragmentary, collectively, when they are synthesized, they present a shared scenario of the passage into the afterlife. When the deceased arrives in the underworld, they are expected to confront obstacles. They must not drink from the river Lath, or forgetfulness, but from Nemosune, or memory. 
They are provided with formulaic expressions with which to present themselves to the guardians of the afterlife. One example states, quote, I am a son of earth and starry sky. I am parched with thirst and am dying, but quickly grant me cold water from the lake of memory to drink, end quote. Although the meandering and fragile text poses difficulties, the inscriptions appear to speak of the unity of life and death and of rebirth, possibly in divine form. One tablet offers instructions for the deceased when standing before and addressing the rulers of the underworld. Quote, Now you have died, and now you have come into being, O oh, thrice happy one, on this same day. Tell Persephone that the Bacchic one himself released you. End quote. Melano is a chthonic nymph or goddess who was invoked in the so-called Orphic Hymn of Melano. Her name also appears on a metal tablet in association with her mother, Persephone. She was said to be the daughter of Persephone and Zeus Chthonios, whose identity is ambiguous, because in the Orphic Hymns it is either representative of another name for Hades or Zeus in a chthonic aspect. In fact, Hades and Zeus were, at times, syncretized with each other. The Orphics in particular believe that Zeus and Hades were the same deity, and thus Zeus was portrayed as having an incarnation in the underworld, identifying him as literally being Hades, which leads to Zeus and Hades essentially being two representations and different facets of the same god, and so an extended divine power. The Orphic hymn to Melano also references this by mentioning that Persephone was impregnated upon the bed of Zeus Cronion in the underworld by the river Cocytus. The hymn regarding Zeus taking on the form of Pluton, or Hades, before impregnating Persephone could very well be related to the very nature of the way the gods were portrayed and worshipped in the Orphic religion, as well as an explanation for why both Hades and Zeus are considered to be the father of Melano. Melano was said to be born at the mouth of the Cocytus, one of the rivers of the underworld, where Hermes was stationed in his underworld aspect of Psychopompos. Melano is also described in Invocation of the Orphic Hymn as Crocopeplos, or clad in saffron, an epithet in ancient Greek poetry that was common for moon goddesses, such as Hecate. According to the Orphic Hymn, Melano has the power to bring nightmares and can drive mortals insane. The purpose of the hymn is to placate her by showing that the Orphic initiates understand and respect her nature, thereby averting the harm that she has the capacity for causing. We discussed last episode how the ancient Greeks similarly placated Hecate. In fact, in the hymn, Melano has characteristics that seem similar to Hecate and the Aranyes, and the name Melano is sometimes thought to be an epithet of Hecate. Melano's connections to Hecate and Hermes suggest that she exercised her power in the realm of the soul's passage, and in that function, she may be compared to the torchbearer Eubolius in the Eleusinian Mysteries. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. You know what's not smart? Job sites that overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. But you know what is smart? ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast. No more sorting through the wrong resumes, no more waiting for the right candidates to apply. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash G-R-E-E-C-E. ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. Magic and the mysteries were a rather private, individual way of getting in close touch with the gods. But in general, the most common way of discovering the will of the gods was through prophetic means. Divination, or mantike techne, is the skill or art of interpreting divine signs or omens, usually in the form of bird signs, but also animal entrails from sacrifices, dreams, oracles, and other various methods thought to be sent by the gods to communicate their will. The fact that oinos, 
the Greek word for omen, is derived from the word for bird, shows how important birds were in this respect. Plutarch later, in his treatise titled On the Intelligence of Animals, writes, quote, One large, well-known and ancient part of prophecy is bird lore. For their sharp perception and quickness in reacting to whatever they see means that the god can use them as his agents. He directs their movements, their cries, and their twitterings, which, like winds, can sometimes be contrary, sometimes favorable, to check or to encourage men's activities and initiatives. That is why Euripides calls birds in general the messengers of the gods, end quote. Two other highly regarded sources for omens were the entrails of sacrificial animals and dreams. But any slightly odd happening could be taken as an omen, such as a sneeze, a word taken out of context, thunder, or an eclipse. What was needed was correct interpretation of the omen. Some things were obvious and anybody could interpret them. For example, omens on the right were lucky and those on the left were bad. But some were harder, and so there were prophets or seers called a mantis who built up a reputation for skill in explaining omens and were said to be divinely inspired by Apollo. An individual or community would consult a seer regarding a situation or problem much in the same way as one consults a doctor. Seers were especially active in times of war, and they regularly accompanied armies on campaigns. Military seers generally divined by means of animal sacrifice. Such a sacrifice before battle, called sphagia, was performed by cutting the animal's throat and observing its last movements and the flow of its blood. The flesh of the victim was not to be eaten, though. In a non-battle situation, divination was done by examining the victim's liver, after which the meat was allowed to be consumed. On the other hand, oracles were thought to be portals through which the gods spoke directly to people. In this sense, they were different from the mantes, or seers, who interpreted signs believed to be sent from the gods. An oracle was a person considered to be inspired by the gods in providing predictions of the future. The word oracle comes from the Latin verb orare, meaning to speak, and properly refers to the priest or priestess uttering the prediction. In its extended use, the word oracle may also refer to the site of the oracle and to the oracular utterances themselves, which were called kresmoi in Greek. We will discuss famous oracles in more detail very shortly. Of all the gods of Mount Olympus, Apollo was the principal god of prophecy, and as such, he had many adherents in Greek myth. A famous case was Tiresias, the son of a shepherd named Averis, and the nymph Chericlo, who herself was a devotee of Athena. Tiresias was a priest of Zeus, and as a young man, while traveling, he encountered two snakes mating on a roadway, and so he hit them with a stick. As a result, he was transformed into a woman, and as a woman, Tiresias then slightly altered his religious role by becoming a priestess of Hera. He, or I guess she, even married and had children, including a daughter named Manto. After seven years as a woman, Tiresias again came across two mating snakes. According to Hyginus, she trampled on them and became a man once more. At some point later, as a result of his and her experiences, Zeus and Hera asked Tiresias to settle the question of which sex, male or female, experienced more pleasure during intercourse. Naturally, Zeus claimed that it was women, and Hera claimed it was men. When Tiresias sided with Zeus, an enraged Hera struck him blind. Since Zeus could not undo what she had done, in return, he gave him the gift of foresight and a lifespan of seven generations. An alternative and less commonly told story was that Tiresias stumbled upon Athena while she was bathing, and thus he saw the virgin goddess naked. Enraged, she struck him blind to ensure that he would never again see what man was not intended to see. His mother Chericlo, who was one of her devotees, begged her to undo her curse, but it was already final. So in return, the blind Tiresias was given a special gift of prophecy to foretell the future. How Tiresias obtained his information varied though. Sometimes, like the oracles, he would receive visions, while other times, he would listen for the songs of birds, meaning augury, or be given descriptions of other people's dreams or images that appeared within the fire or smoke of burnt offerings, and then he interpreted them. However, it was his ability to communicate with the dead, or necromancy, that he relied upon the most. 
Teresius' pronouncements were always given in short maxims that were often cryptic, but never wrong. Like most oracles, he was generally extremely reluctant to offer the whole of what he saw in his visions. Thanks to the gift of an extended life that he was given by Zeus, the blind seer Teresius participated fully in seven generations in Thebes, beginning as an advisor to the city's founder Cadmus, all the way to the story of the Epigoni, who successfully took the city a generation before the Trojan War. And so he was in the backdrop of all of the tragic Theban plays from the classical period, which we discussed in episode 51. In Sophocles' Oedipus the King, the playwright makes it known the huge role that the blind seer had when he writes that Tiresias is the one prophet, quote, who stands nearest to the Lord Phoebus Apollo in divination, end quote. Tiresias died after drinking tainted water from the Tilfusa Spring, where he was struck by an arrow of Apollo, because it was his time to finally die. His shade descended to the Asphodel Meadows, the first level of Hades. After his death, he was visited in the underworld by Odysseus, found in Book 9 of Homer's Odyssey, whom he gave valuable advice concerning the rest of his journey, such as how to get past Scylla and Charybdis, and not to eat the cattle of Helios on Thranachia. Advice which Odysseus's men did not follow, which led to them getting killed by Zeus's thunderbolts during a storm. Mopsus was a celebrated seer and diviner and was the son of Manto, a daughter of Tiresias, which would make him Tiresias' grandson, who because of Tiresias' long lifespan, flourished at the same time as his grandfather. Greeks of the classical age accepted Mopsus as a historical figure, though the anecdotes concerning him often bridge legend and myth. In fact, his unerring wisdom and discernment gave rise to the ancient Greek proverb, more certain than Mopsus. He distinguished himself at the Siege of Thebes, but he was held in particular veneration at the court of Amphilochus, in Colophon, and at Claros, which he founded, on the Ionian coast of Asia Minor, which was adjacent to Caria. There will be more on Claros shortly. Another famous seer was Idmon, allegedly a son of Apollo and a mortal named Asteria. He foresaw his own death, if he partook in the Argonauts' expedition, but joined anyway. And true to form, during the outbound voyage to the Argo, a boar killed him in Bithynia. But he had a grandson named Calchas, who became an even more illustrious seer than Idmon. Calchas had a gift for interpreting the flight of birds that he had received personally from Apollo, and so as an augur, he had no rival. He also interpreted the entrails of the enemy during the tide of battle. In fact, it was Calchas who had prophesied that in order for Agamemnon to gain the favorable wind needed to deploy the fleet of Greek ships that mustered in Aulis on their way to Troy, he would need to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia to appease Artemis, whom he had offended for killing one of her sacred deer. He also prophesied that Troy would be sacked in the tenth year of the war. Homer in the Iliad writes that Calchas was such a man that, quote, past, present, and future held no secrets for him. It was his second sight, a gift he owed to Apollo that had guided the Achaean fleet to Troy. End quote. Also in the Iliad, Colchis told the Greeks that the captive Chryseis must be returned to her father Chryseis in order to get Apollo to stop the plague that he had sent as a punishment. This triggered the quarrel of Achilles and Agamemnon, the main theme of the Iliad. In Quintus of Smyrna's post-Homerica, Colchis told the Argives that the city could more easily be taken by strategy than by force, and so he endorsed Odysseus' suggestion that the Trojan horse would effectively infiltrate the city of Troy. Colchis also had foreseen that the Trojan prince, Aeneas, would survive the battle and found a new city, and so he warned the Argives that they would not be able to kill him. Unfortunately, though, Colchis died of shame in Colophon in Asia Minor, shortly after the Trojan War, after his rival, the aforementioned Mopsus, the grandson of Tiresias, beat him in a contest of soothsaying. Having been consulted on one occasion by Amphilochus, who was one of the Epigoni and who wished to know if his army would be successful in a war that he was intending to undertake, Mopsus predicted the greatest calamities, whereas Colchis promised the greatest successes. Amphilochus followed the opinion of Colchis, but the prediction of Mopsus was fully verified, as Amphilochus' army was crushed. This had such a shameful effect upon Colchis that he died soon after. In another version, the two soothsayers, jealous of each other's fame, came to a different trial of their skill and divination. 
Colchis first asked Mopsus how many figs a neighboring tree could bear, to which Mopsus replied, with 10,001. The figs were then gathered, and his answer was found to be true. It was now Mopsus' turn to try his adversary, and so he asked him how many young ones a certain pregnant sow would bring forth, and at what time. Colchis confessed his inability to answer, whereupon Mopsus declared that she would be delivered on the next day and would bring forth ten young ones, of which only one would be a male. The following day saw the veracity of his prediction proved, and Colchis died through the grief which his defeat produced. Amphilochus subsequently made a visit to Argos and entrusted the sovereign power of Colophon to Mopsus to keep it for him during the space of a year. On his return, though, Mopsus refused to restore the kingdom to him. A quarrel thus ensued in which they slew each other. Famous seers weren't just relegated to mythic or semi-mythic history either. For example, in historical times, Lampon had a great reputation as a seer. He was a friend of Pericles who had helped found the colony of Thurai in southern Italy in the mid-5th century BC, an event that we will discuss in a future episode. Plutarch in his Life of Pericles relays a story about him which provides an interesting anecdote for the confrontation that was taking place between religion and philosophy. Quote, the head of a one-horned ram was once sent to Pericles from his estate in the country, when Lampon, the prophet, saw that the horn had grown strong and solid from the middle of the forehead. He said that victory and the rivalry between the two parties in the state, led by Thucydides, not the historian, and Pericles, would go to the man to whom this sign had been given. However, Anaxagoras, the philosopher and another friend of Pericles, had the skull dissected and showed that the brain had not filled its proper cavity, but had been displaced in a pointed, egg-shaped formation to that place in the cranium where the horn grew. At the time, Anaxagoras won the admiration of the people there. But a little later, it was Lampon's turn to be admired when Thucydides was ostracized and the entire control of state affairs passed to Pericles. However, there is nothing, in my opinion, to prevent both scientist and prophet from being right, the first correctly explaining the cause of the omen, the second its meaning. For it was the job of the first to observe why it came to be and how it developed into what it was, whereas the second was concerned to declare what its purpose was and what it signified. There are people who say that to discover the cause of a happening robs it of any significance. But they do not realize that this argument does away not only with divine portents, but with all artificial symbols, like the noise of gongs, the light of fire beacons, and the shadow of sundials. Each of these has been deliberately used to convey some meaning, but this is perhaps a subject for another essay. End quote. We will, in fact, take Plutarch's advice here and talk more about Thurai, Pericles, Lampon, and Anaxagoras in future episodes. Finally, if you wish to learn the god's will, you could inquire directly to the gods through their oracles. Although there were collections of past oracles that had been interpreted, these collections might have been too vague, or in the case of some, were suspected to be forged. So if you could afford the time and money, you went to ask the oracle for yourself. In historical times, the word Sibyl came to mean any woman that the ancient Greeks believed were oracles. The earliest sibyls, according to legend, prophesied at sites sacred to a god or goddess, and their prophecies were influenced by divine inspiration from that specific deity. Originally, as at Delphi, they were Chthonic deities. More on that shortly. Various writers have attested to the existence of sibyls in Greece, Italy, the Levant, and Asia Minor. The original sibyl, though, lived near Troy. Her name was Sibyl, hence why all others were named after her. Apollo was attracted to her and spent much of his time trying to woo and court her. As often happened, Apollo tried to win her over by offering some spectacular gift that he believed would melt her heart. But as also often happened in Apollo's courtships, this didn't work on Sybil, who flat out denied him. At a loss for how to win her over, Apollo finally told her that he would give to her anything that her heart desired. With that, the Sibyl responded to him, and she reached down into the sand at her feet where she stood, and picked up a handful of it. She then proclaimed that she wanted one year of life for every grain of sand in her hand, and Apollo immediately granted this to her. Still though, the Sibyl was not won over, and this frustrated Apollo to no end. He could not take back what he had already given to her, but he needed some way to punish her for refusing him. 
And so after mulling it over, he realized that Sybil had made a crucial mistake in her request. Although she gained for herself a life of a thousand years, as that was how many grains of sand had been in her hand, she had forgotten to also ask for perpetual youth. Apollo only had to let age take its course, and after the years went by, Sybil found herself withered and frail, but unable to die. Although Sybil was the name given to the specific girl that Apollo courted, it was also used for all prophetesses of Apollo, generally speaking. One of the Sibyls, maybe even the original, was said to have lived in central Italy at Cumae, where Apollo had a temple carved into a vast cave. There, with her body all withered and faded, she remained simply as a weak voice that could be heard groaning from within. Apollo was said to visit her in the vast cave, overcome her, and speak through her with words that would echo from many mouths of the cave. The description of his speaking through her sounds something like demon possession, or as Virgil in his Aeneid describes it, like a wild horse trying to throw a rider. Clearly, the Greeks and Romans believed that the Sibyl would enter some sort of ecstatic trance and widely babble the prophecies and admonishes of the god. Another myth of the wannabe Don Juan Apollo involves the mortal woman Cassandra, the daughter of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy. In order to win her over, he gave her the gift of prophecy, but Cassandra too was not impressed, and so she refused him, just like Sybil. An angry Apollo allowed her to keep his gift, but he punished her by making it so that she would always tell the truth about the future, and that nobody would believe her visions, such as at the end of the Trojan War, when she tells everyone not to bring the horse into the city, but was ignored. Or when she vainly warns Agamemnon, who had taken her captive, that his wife would kill him as well as her, when the two of them arrived back at his palace in Mycenae. When you wanted to consult an oracle in the ancient world, you went to either Dodona in northwest Greece, where the leaves of Zeus's oaks gave his oracles, or you could go to the cave of Trophonius in Boeotia, where after a terrifying crawl into a black subterranean hole, you heard or saw the future. Of course, you could go to the most famous site of them all, that being Delphi, which was and still is one of the most striking places in the world. Perched on a rocky slope of Mount Parnassus, Delphi has a stunning view, and visitors to the site often note that it has a transcendent spiritual quality about it. It is not surprising, then, that atop its mountain peaks, people felt the gods particularly near. A thriving Mycenaean village and cult area were abandoned at the end of the Bronze Age. But in the mid-9th century BC, people returned to this lovely spot and resettled it. Fifty years later, Delphi had already become a regional gathering place for the worship of Apollo. Fueled by the popularity of the oracle, its fame grew until it became the premier sanctuary of Apollo in the Greek world, exerting a unique influence on Greek colonization and interstate relations. Its only rival in this respect was the Pan-Hellenic Sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia. During the Archaic period, a mythic pedigree for Apollo's sanctuary was established in order to cement its claim to be the most important oracle in the Greek world. According to tradition, immediately after his birth, Themis fed Apollo with nectar and ambrosia instead of milk, so that he grew rapidly. In fact, in just one day, he freed himself from his swaddling clothes and stood upright so that he looked fearsome even to the gods, as a strapping young man. The first thing that he did was to demand for himself a lyre and a bow, with which he intended to capture some land, and declared that he would travel and reveal the will of Zeus to mankind. When he reached Olympus, he was welcomed by all of the gods, while Leto and Zeus felt proud of having such a son. Zeus then told him that in order to fulfill his desires of revealing his will to mankind, he must establish an oracle, and so he gave him a chariot drawn by white swans to help him get there. He left Olympus, and after having visited many places in Greece, he arrived at the plain of Crissa, which sat below the steep slopes of Mount Parnassus in central Greece. This place would become known as Delphi, and is explained from the following story. Scanning the sea from high above the mountain, Apollo saw a ship with Cretans aboard, who were heading for Pylos. Apollo appeared to these sailors by leaping aboard their vessel as they sailed by. He transformed into a dolphin and drove the terrified sailors to a port at the foot of Mount Parnassus. After then transforming into a handsome youth, he appointed the sailors as the first priests of his temple there. 
This etymology of the word Delphi, as coming from the Greek word Delphis, or dolphin, is certainly a late addition to explain the name of the town and Apollo's epithet, Delphinios. It is more likely, though, that Apollo's function of bringing young men into society reminded the Greeks of the social habits of dolphins, and dolphins are so called because the root meaning of Delphus in Greek is womb, since they among the fish of the sea are mammals and have a womb. If that is the real origin of Delphi and Delphinius, then perhaps the words recall the Greeks perceived designation of Delphi as the omphalos, or navel of the world. The omphalos is said to be the stone that Kronos swallowed instead of a baby Zeus and then threw up when he was given an emetic by Metis before Zeus led his charge against his father in the Titanomachy. It still supposedly resides in Delphi, marking the city as the center of the world. The story goes that Zeus found this center by finding two eagles of equal speed and released them at the ends of the earth to see where they met each other and they crossed paths at Delphi. According to Aeschylus in his play The Eumenides, before Apollo's arrival, Delphi was already sacred as a place of prophecy for Gaia, where a sibyl used to stand on a stone and give prophecies. Although Gaia did have older oracles, like the one at Olympia, the lack of archaeological or literary evidence for Gaia's presence at Delphi before the 5th century BC makes it difficult to accept the historicity of this tradition. Regardless, the Homeric hymn to Apollo gives the foundation legend for the sanctuary, telling how the god battled a huge serpent, later known as the Python, for possession of the site. Some scholars have argued that the myth represents Apollo as a northern Dorian intruder. His arrival at the site must have occurred during the so-called Dark Ages that followed the decline of the Mycenaean civilization, and his conflict with the older Gaia, or Mother Earth, was represented by the legend of his slaying her daughter, the serpent Python and so it represents the capturing of the Hellenes of a pre-Hellenic shrine. Other scholars have described the myth as an allegory for the dispersal of the fogs and clouds of vapor which arrive from ponds and marshes, represented by Python who lived at the center of the earth, by the rays of the sun, representative by the arrows of Apollo, who as we will discuss on the next episode, will come to be known as a sun god. Anyways, the myth goes that when Leto was pregnant with Artemis and Apollo, Hera sent the serpent to hunt her to her death across the world so that she could not deliver wherever the sun shone. And so after Apollo had grown up, he wanted to avenge his mother's plight. To achieve this, he begged Hephaestus for a bow and arrows that could penetrate the serpent's skin. After receiving them, Apollo pursued the python to the sacred cave of Mount Parnassus beside the Castalian Spring. The oracle there, on her tripod, had warned the serpent that one day a son of Leto would come and slay him in revenge. So when Python saw Apollo coming, he knew what this meant and immediately unleashed his fury, spitting venom and fire at the god, while the god shot him with a thousand arrows. A great struggle ensued until finally the venom flowed down the mountain in torrents and the serpent lay dead. Apollo allowed his body to rot on the spot. This detail probably developed from a play on the Greek word pytho, because the verb pythomai means to rot. Other authors, such as Strabo, interpret the etymology of python to come from pinthanomai, which means to seek to find out, an interpretation that associates the name of the area with its prophetic mission, as an oracle of the god Apollo. Anyways, from then onwards, Delphi belonged to Apollo, and he would take the epithet Pythian, the hymn then explains how he supervised the building of his first temple at Delphi, which was made out of laurel branches, and then he established the Pythian Games in honor of his victory over Python. In reality, though, archaeologists date the earliest temple of Apollo on site to the late 7th century BC, and the Pythian Games began in 582 BC after the First Sacred War, as we discussed in episodes 10 and 16 respectively. Apollo's temple at Delphi was the site of a famous oracle where many visitors came wishing to consult the god by asking questions of his priestess, the Pythia, who received Apollo's prophetic voice. Together with the games in the stadium and the theater high up the mountain, Delphi became a focus for the whole of the Greek world. Many poles showed their respect for the gods and their wish for his support by building treasuries in which they stored their gifts. Its reputation grew so much that foreigners, too, asked the oracle's advice, as we have seen in episode 31 with the story of King Croesus of Lydia. Certain indicators had to occur before the Pythia could even be consulted, though. 
Plutarch, who was himself a Delphic priest in the 2nd century AD, indicates in his Moralia that a libation was poured on a sacrificial animal to test its vitality and thus its suitability for sacrifice. If all parts of the animal didn't tremble and shake, or if the animal didn't make a noise, quote, they say that the oracle is not functioning, and they do not even bring in the Pythia, end quote. The Pythia was a local woman, more than 50 years old, who was appointed for life and was expected to remain chaste throughout her tenure. Before she delivered a prophecy, the Pythia purified herself with water from the nearby Castalian Spring, which sat at the base of Mount Parnassus. This spring was named after the nymph Castalia, who had jumped into it at one point to flee from Apollo, when he was aggressively pursuing her, another one of his forlorn courtships that didn't go quite as planned. As a result, water from the Castalian spring was considered sacred, and it was used to clean the Delphian temples and to inspire the Pythia. In the last oracle ever given, it is mentioned that the water which could speak has been lost forever. Anyways, after purifying herself in the sacred spring, the Pythia then burned laurel leaves and barley meal on the altar of Apollo's temple, before she climbed up inside and entered the inner room of the temple and sat on a covered tripod cauldron, clutching a branch of the burnt laurel in her mouth, which was Apollo's sacred symbol. We will discuss the importance of the laurel tree very shortly. There, the Pythia received the questions of the petitioners and then experienced a form of a religious ecstasy. Plato describes her as being obsessed by mania, or frenzy. It was probably the influence of Dionysic worship that induced the Delphic god to give his oracles through the mouth of a woman who was cast into a state of divine frenzy. If you recall from episode 55, worshippers of Dionysus gathered at night on mountaintops by torchlight, and as part of the rites, they fell into a sort of frenzied ecstasy, in which their souls were thought to be in mystic communion with Dionysus. Regardless of who or what had originally influenced it, the actual cause of the Pythias frenzy has been the subject of much speculation by scholars, both ancient and modern, throughout the centuries. According to various theories, the Pythia owed her inspiration to either a drink from the Castalian Spring, to laurel leaves that she chewed, to a mediumistic trance that required no artificial stimulant, or to intoxicating vapors that arose from a chasm in the earth. This last possibility, which was taken seriously by Plutarch in his Moralia and Strabo in his Geography, but was traditionally scoffed at by modern scholars, has since been revived after geologists newly evaluated the site of Delphi in the 1990s. They concluded that ethylene, a sweet-smelling, mildly intoxicating gas that was found to be present in the limestone beneath the temple, could have contributed to the Pythias trance. Essentially, the Pythia became high from breathing in this gas and then began babbling, sort of like she was being possessed by Apollo, and the priests wrote down and interpreted her answers into verse-like oracles. The responses of the Pythia were highly enigmatic, though. As the early Greek philosopher Heraclitus remarks, quote, The Lord, whose oracle is at Delphi, neither speaks out nor conceals, but gives a sign, end quote. However, none of the earliest sources describe the Pythia as being frenzied, and she is always described by them as responding directly to the petitioners in intelligible speech, though sometimes her answers were ambiguous and riddling. This impreciseness can be attributed to the phenomena in which human nature tends to understand something in one way, meaning the way they want to hear it, when it is actually intended to be understood in another way. However, there were several earthquakes at Delphi, and so it could have been that the amount of ethylene gas that emitted increased over time, so that the Pythias gave oracles in an increasingly induced trance-like state. Or it could have been, as Plutarch suggested, that the vapor in the shrine varied in strength periodically. The ambiguity of the oracle's replies might seem to throw doubt on its value to the Greek world. But it is quite clear that, despite apparent mistakes, it had enormous influence. In myth, Apollo often predicted catastrophic future events, such as Oedipus' murder of his father. In reality, he more often advised petitioners on the best course of action for addressing their problems, specializing in ritualistic solutions that invoke the aid of the gods. If a town suffered from a plague or crop failure, 
Perhaps the citizens had neglected to make the proper sacrifices or purifications. If land shortages resulted in civic discord, or if new trade connections were required, Apollo might recommend as a course of action that colonists settle in newer, more likely areas overseas. And so the oracle could be consulted on virtually any major enterprise contemplated by a city, from legal reform to military conquest, as well as religious and personal problems. Concern about the fertility of both humans and the earth were among the most common inquiries. Plutarch in his Moralia says that, quote, people ask if they are going to be victorious, if they are going to marry, if it is to their advantage to sail, to farm, or to go abroad, end quote. The continuous congregation of delegates from many cities there also ensured that Delphi remained a valuable resource for intelligence gathering and diplomatic exchange. It is believed by some scholars that the priests must have had a spy network throughout the Greek world in order to gather information so that nobody could expose them as a fake, which is why it sometimes took months to receive an answer. The political importance of Delphi thus meant that it must not be under the control of any one state, and after a series of sacred wars, the sanctuary was placed under the supervision of a federation of local states known as the Delphic Amphictyoni. Furthermore, the Pythia only made prophecies one day per month, on the 7th, a day sacred to Apollo, and during the nine-month season, when Apollo was believed to be in residence. He was absent during the winter, when he was said to be visiting the Hyperboreans. There will be more on why the 7th is sacred to Apollo and the Hyperboreans on the next episode. This means that in theory, the Pythia only made prophecies on nine days during a calendar year, and so as you can expect, lines must have been very long. This helps to explain why consultations in the early centuries of the oracle were dominated by important matters of state, and less by individual concerns, like you would see with Zeus's oracle at Dodona. By the classical period, though, the oracle at Delphi seems to have been consulted primarily on matters involving religious practice and procedure. Apollo's oracular cult was already fully established at Delphi when written sources appear for the site around 650 BC. Because of Apollo's sponsorship of colonization efforts and his importance for civic decision making, the cult of Apollo Pythios became extremely important to the Greek world as an oracular deity in the Archaic period. And the frequency of theophoric names, such as Apollodorus or Apollonius, and cities named Apollonia, testified to his popularity. In this role, he often bears the titles of Archegetus, or the founder, and Catistus, or the establisher, which were titles also given to founders of colonies. Specifically, the Spartans believed that Apollo played an instrumental role in creating their constitution. In their agora, they had statues of Pythian Apollo, Artemis, and Leto, and the kings appointed a board of Pythioi, who were responsible for traveling to Delphi and making state consultations of the oracle. In Athens, the Pythion was the oldest cult center of the god. At Argos, where an important sanctuary of Apollo Pythios was located on the Darius Ridge between the two citadels, the cult seems to have been appropriated from Asine, which the Argives destroyed at the end of the 8th century BC. Another widespread and early cult, common to many Dorian and Ionian cities, is that of Apollo Delphinios. The Greeks believed that this name originated from their word for dolphin, or Delphis, but the real etymology is unknown, and is most likely non-Greek. Both ancients and moderns have understood this god, though, to have been a protector of seafarers, and have speculated that his cult is related to that at Delphi. The pun-loving author of the Homeric Hymn to Apollo has the god appear in dolphin form and demand that the first priests of Delphi erect an altar to him under this name, as we mentioned earlier. More recent scholarship has noted the important role of Apollo Delphinios in civic life, particularly with regard to intercity relations. Official documents, including treaties, were stored in temples of Apollo Delphinios, and he was associated with the Ephibes, or young adults who were undergoing military training in order to become citizens. At Miletus, where Apollo Delphinios was the patron of the city, the annual procession to the oracular shrine at Didyma started from the Delphinion. When excavated, the sanctuary was found to contain hundreds of inscriptions recording citizenship decrees, treaties, occult calendar, and other matters of interest to the state. We will discuss Miletus, Didyma, and Apollo Delphinios more very shortly. 
Since Python was a child of Gaia, Apollo had to wash and cleanse himself from the act of murder in the special river of Penios in the valley of Tempe in Thessaly. It was kind of like a catharsis, referring to the emotional cleansing of the soul, but in this case, it was a physical act of washing away one's sins. Afterwards, Apollo was to spend a year of exile here, before he would be allowed to return to Mount Olympus. Because of this, he gained the skill of purifying others and could thus help humans cleanse themselves at his temple. Miasma, meaning pollution, refers to the mental and spiritual healing that Apollo also gives. This is similar to purification, which is something that Apollo has had to do many times, for he committed many transgressions. Purification was an important specialty of Apollo's cult, although there is surprisingly little evidence for the purification rituals, such as the cleansing of blood guilt, that were performed at Delphi itself. We will discuss Apollo's role in purification in more detail next episode. Many gods possessed sacred groves, but they are especially characteristic of Apollo, whose major shrines were often located outside the cities. Apollo's special tree was the Daphne, or Laurel, and he was worshipped particularly in central Greece as Apollo Daphne Phoros, or the Laurel Carrier. The Laurel had a purifying effect because of its sweet, aromatic leaves, and in Euripides' Ion, we hear how the titled character, who was an orphan raised at Delphi, sweeps the temple entrance and hangs up garlands of laurel branches every morning. Processions of laurel carriers may have even served a similar purpose of purification long before the advent of Apollo's cultic worship in Greece. Just like with his association with Delphi, a myth was constructed to explain Apollo's connection with the laurel. During his year of ritual cleansing, Apollo came across a forest nymph named Daphne, who was the daughter of the river god Peneus. She had spurned all suitors and took a vow of chastity, preferring instead to participate in woodland sports and wandering about in the forest. This amorous vignette was retold by many Hellenistic and Roman authors and has inspired many ancient and Renaissance artists. According to Ovid, Apollo had been making fun of Eros, the Roman Cupid, on account of his little bow and arrow, boasting that his bow was bigger and his arrows were more powerful. So the insulted god of love prepared two arrows, one of gold and one of lead. He shot Apollo with his golden arrow, causing him to fall madly in love with Daphne. Simultaneously, Cupid shot Daphne with the lead arrow, instilling in her a repulsion for Apollo. Having fallen completely smitten for her, Apollo aggressively pursued after Daphne. She ran from him, and he chased her for days. When she was about to collapse near her father, the river Peneus, she realized that Apollo was not going to give up, and she prayed to her father to save her. Her father took pity on her and turned her into a laurel tree, hence why the Greek word for it is Daphne. Apollo hugged the tree, and in spite of Daphne's rejection, he vowed to love her and keep her close to him forever. True to his word, he took a laurel branch and wrapped it around his head, and henceforth it became his special symbol. Apollo also used his powers of eternal youth and immortality to render Daphne evergreen. For this reason, the leaves of the laurel tree do not decay. Once Apollo's expiation was over, he returned to Delphi, crowned with a laurel wreath. To honor his return, the people of Delphi instituted the Septaria Festival, to be held every nine years, and the rite of the Septaria was a representation of Python's slaughter by Apollo. Next to the god's sanctuary, the Delphians used to build a wooden hut for each festival, symbolizing the monster's lair. A procession, led by Apeus Amphitalis, or a boy that had both of his parents still alive, approached the hut holding firebrands in their hands. The child who personified Apollo then shot an arrow at the hut, and they all set it on fire. While it burnt down, they rushed away without looking back. The Delphians, as well as other Greek poles, also celebrated the Daphnophoria, which represented the ritual of Apollo's expiation to the Valley of Tempe in Thessaly. We are best informed about the celebration of the Daphnephoria at Thebes, the leading city of Boeotia. It was held in honor of Apollo Ismenios, who was one of the most important gods of Thebes, and was named for the Ismenos River running through the city. In his discussion of ancient hymns, Proclus, who was quoted by Photius in his Bibliotheca, says that a child personifying Apollo, just like at the Septaria, set off with other peers to walk in a sacred procession along the path the god had followed when going to Tempe. 
With young participants, the Daphnephoria was able to combine components together, which signified an important stage or rite of passage. The young boy was designated as the Daphnephorus, or laurel bearer, and he carried an olive branch adorned with laurel and flowers and several small bronze balls, which were then twined around with purple ribbons, and at the lower end with saffron ribbons. These balls were said to indicate the sun, stars, and moon, while the ribbons referred to the days of the year. The Daphnephorus either wore a golden crown or a wreath of laurel and was richly dressed with the pole in his hand. He was followed by a chorus of girls carrying suppliant branches and singing a hymn to the god. When they arrived at Tempe, they offered a sacrifice to the god's altar and returned to their home polis to dedicate a bronze tripod in a local temple of Apollo. They also brought back laurel branches with them. Such festivals of bringing in the tree to symbolize prosperity are found in connection with other deities, including Hera and Dionysus. And so the ritual, not the god, is considered to be primary. But this rite is especially important because the laurel branches brought back to Delphi were used to make the crowns for the victors at the Pythian Games. At the Pythian Festival, held every four years, one of the most important contests was the Pythian Nome, in which musicians presented in song their interpretations of Apollo's combat with the serpent. The Pythian Games originally focused upon artistic contests of lyre playing and singing to the flute, though athletic events soon began to gain in popularity, as the festival was modeled more closely on the Olympic Games. We discussed the Pythian Festival in more detail in episode 21. The oldest temple, probably dedicated to Apollo Ismenios at Thebes, was built in the 9th century BC, and it seems that it was a curvy linear building. A Doric temple was built in the early 7th century BC, but only some small parts have been found. Visitors to the temple of Apollo Ismenios at Thebes would have been impressed by the numerous dedications of tripods, including one of gold that was dedicated by Croesus of Lydia. Others were reputed to date to the Heroic Age. Writing in the 5th century BC, Herodotus attributed some of the tripods he saw to the time of King Oedipus. He says that they were inscribed with Cadmian letters, a reference to the Phoenician immigrant Cadmus, who according to tradition had settled in Thebes, founded the city, and brought with him the alphabet. Regardless of what Herodotus may have thought, these tripods were probably early gifts to the sanctuary, which was founded at the end of the 8th century BC. Other tripods were dedicated by youths after they served as Daphnophoroi. Apollo's oracles here were delivered through omens, as priests observed sacrificial animals burning in the flames on the altar. A number of subsidiary heroes and heroines were venerated at the Ismenion as well, including Teneros, who in myth was the first seer at the shrine. He was the son of Apollo and an Oceate nymph named Melia. Apollo had other oracles on the Greek mainland. Yet the majority of Apollo's shrines there were not oracular. Either that or their oracles faded because they could not sustain competition with Delphi. One district with a strong independent oracular tradition, though, was Boeotia, where the sanctuary of Apollo Patois thrived in spite of its relative proximity to Delphi. The hero Patois, named for the triple-peaked Mount Patoan, may have preceded Apollo as the resident deity of the sanctuary. Its most prosperous period began in the late 7th century BC, when Kuroi became fashionable dedications. As typical archaic gifts to the gods, these stiffly frontal, sculpted nude youths made especially appropriate votives for Apollo, himself a divine Kuros, or youth. We discussed these quite a bit in episode 17. About 100 Kuroi were dedicated during the 7th and 6th centuries BC and discovered in the excavation of the site, providing a treasure trove for the study of archaic sculpture. The sanctuary even attracted attention outside Boeotia, particularly from the neighboring Athenians. Visitors included Hipparchus, a son of the Athenian tyrant Pisistratus, who left an inscribed dedication. Herodotus gives us our only account of the oracular procedure in his story of a foreigner named Miss who consulted the oracle during the Persian Wars. As soon as Miss entered the shrine, the male prophet shocked the Greeks who were present by uttering words that they could not understand. But Miss declared that the oracle was responding in his own language, that being Carrion, and left satisfied. Some heroes were clearly local deities who were absorbed into this category as the pantheon of major Greek gods crystallized. For example, both Amphieros and Trophonios, 
possess prophetic powers, which was unusual for Greek heroes and which hints at their former divine status. Amphieros, the Argive seer who fought as one of the seven against Thebes, was swallowed into a chasm as he fled the battle in his chariot. Thereafter, he lived beneath the earth, still practicing the profession of a seer through the medium of an oracular priestess. According to Herodotus, his oracle at or near Thebes was well known by the late archaic period. Though he was a former enemy, Amphieros became a benefactor of Thebes, following a common cultic pattern according to which hostile heroic figures were reconciled through worship and appeasement. Later, the Athenians popularized their own cult of Amphieros at the rival site of Oropos, on the much contested border area between Attica and Boeotia. The buildings at the site, which has been extensively studied, date no earlier than the late 5th century BC. Here, the focus of the oracle shifted to healing, a much more common occupation of heroes, and Amphieros' cult functioned in many ways like that of Asclepius, except that it charged a fee, like an oracular shrine. Pausanias describes the 4th century BC altar of Amphieros, which was divided into five sections for different groups of gods and heroes. In order to be healed, visitors made purification sacrifices, normally a piglet was used for this purpose, to all of the deities named on the altar, and then sacrificed a ram and slept on its fleece in the temple. The resulting dreams were interpreted as prescriptions for the proper treatment of the disease. Boeotia was a land particularly and unusually rich in oracles, and the concept of the hero who was swallowed by the earth seems to have been endemic to this area. Trophonius, the Boeotian master builder who with his brother Agamedes constructed Apollo's first temple at Delphi, disappeared into a chasm at Lebedea and became an oracular deity. Consultation at this oracle, already renowned in the archaic period, was a unique and terrifying experience. Pausanias wrote from personal knowledge about the elaborate purifications and sacrifices required as preparation for an encounter with Trophonius, many of which must have been operative in earlier times. The key preliminary was the sacrifice of a ram at the Bothros, or pit, where Trophonius disappeared, with an invocation to Agamedes and the examination of the entrails to determine the mood of Trophonius. Another archaic feature was the statue of Trophonius attributed to Daedalus, which was revealed only to those about to consult the oracle. Those who received acceptable omens climbed into a man-made subterranean chamber and poised themselves at a small opening in the floor, carrying honey cakes as a gift. They were sucked down into the second place by unknown means, where they came into personal contact with the divine power. Eventually, they were expelled by the same route dazed and disoriented. Whatever they saw or heard, they were required to record on wooden tablets. In the time of Pausanias, it is clear that consultation of Trophonius was similar to initiation into one of the mystery cults, but in the archaic period, it may have been more narrowly focused on pragmatic oracular responses. Another mainland oracle of Apollo was the sanctuary of Apollo Abeos at Abai in the northeastern corner of Phocis. It too was famous in antiquity as it was consulted by foreign leaders, including Croesus of Lydia and the Persian general Mardonius. It was rich in treasures but was destroyed by the Persians in the 5th century BC and the second time by the Boeotians in the 4th century BC. It remained in a ruined state until it was restored by the Roman emperor Hadrian in the 2nd century AD. And another one, at the Argive shrine of Apollo Pythias, a female prophet gave oracles after tasting the blood of a sacrificed female sheep. Yet these sanctuaries in the Greek mainland were atypical. In the Greek colonies of Asia Minor, though, the situation was reversed, as the entire Aegean coastline was dotted with oracular shrines to Apollo. The Eastern Greeks had rich traditions of Apollo worship, influenced by their non-Greek neighbors, which we will discuss in more detail next episode, and were distant enough from Delphi geographically to require their own oracle centers. The most famous was at Didyma, though it never achieved the prominence of Delphi in Greek affairs, because its interests were too closely aligned with the nearby Miletus, a powerful Ionian city in its own right. By the Archaic period, the oracle of Didyma was ruled by a family of prophets, called the Branchidae, who traced their ancestry to the beautiful herdsman Brancos. According to myth, Apollo had once spotted Brancos with his flocks and immediately fell in love with him, 
He kissed Brancos and bestowed on him a crown, a laurel rod, and the power of prophecy, which he passed down to his descendants. The story explains Philesios, or loving, one of Apollo's cult titles at Didyma. When Apollo became angry with the Milesians and sent a plague, Brancos saved the people by either striking or sprinkling them with a purifying laurel branch. Didyma and Miletus remained close partners throughout the history of the sanctuary. As we mentioned earlier, the patron god of Miletus was Apollo Delphinios, and his priests, the Mopoi, or singers, began every new year with a grand procession that traveled from the Delphinion along the sacred way to Didyma, a distance of about 17 kilometers, or 10.5 miles. Along this route were ritual way stations and statues of male and female members of the Brancidae family, as well as statues of animals. Some of these statues, dating to the 6th century BC, are now housed in the British Museum. The sanctuary itself can be traced archaeologically to the 8th century BC, when it enclosed the sacred spring that was used to induce the oracle's prophetic trance. Around 600 BC, a portico was added to shelter visitors and display the increasing number of votive offerings. These included the pharaoh Necho's gift of a royal garment, worn at his victory over Josiah, king of Judah, in the Battle of Megiddo in 609 BC. Didyma also received treasures from the rich Lydian king Croesus, who sent gifts to a number of Greek oracles, as we have mentioned. In the 6th century BC, a huge temple was constructed in the tradition of the colossal Ionic temples of Hera at Samos and Artemis at Ephesus. However, it differed from the temples of mainland Greece, as it was designed as an unroofed courtyard that enclosed a grove of laurels and the sacred spring. At one end, a small roofed shrine, called the Neskos, was provided to house the cult statue of Apollo Didymaeus, which was designed by the sculptor Kanakos of Sicyon. He created a roughly life-sized cast bronze figure of the nude god in a standing frontal pose with one leg forward. In his left hand was a bow, and in his outstretched right palm, the god held a stag. With respect to ritual practice, osteological analysis of the finds from Didyma has revealed that the sacrificial procedure was not typical, as thigh bones of cattle were not burned on the altar, but were deposited, unburned, and whole in specially intended places. The accumulation of these bones like the horn altars of other sanctuaries, must have formed an impressive visual record of the gifts allotted to the gods in the sanctuary. Unfortunately, the oracular procedure that was so well documented at Delphi is virtually unknown at Didyma, and thus must be reconstructed on the basis of the temple's construction plan. But it appears that several features of Delphi may have been adopted. For example, the priestess, who was seated above the sacred spring, gave utterances in classical hexameters that were interpreted by the Brancidae. However, whereas at Delphi nothing was written, at Didyma, inquiries and answers were written down. A small structure, the Cresmographion, featured in this process. It was a separate building to the northwest of the temple where the oracles were written down. The Milesians and their neighbors consulted the oracle for much the same reasons as the other Greeks consulted Delphi. Didyma played an important role in Miletus' vigorous colonization program, which we discussed in episode 15. A few 6th century BC consultations are recorded in inscriptions. One petitioner asked for advice on whether to engage in piracy, and was told to follow the practices of his ancestors, while another query dealt with whether women should be permitted in the sanctuary of Heracles. A recently discovered archaic inscription from Olbia, found on a bone tablet, preserves an enigmatic text linking the colony's fate with multiples of Apollo's sacred number, seven, in different aspects of the god. Quote, seven, wolf without strength, 77, terrible lion, 777, bow bearer, friendly with his gift, with the power of a healer, 7,777, wise dolphin, peace to the blessed city, Olbia. I pronounce her to be happy, I bear remembrance to Leto, end quote. A second inscription on the same tablet mentions Apollo of Didyma, and the tablet has therefore been interpreted as a record of an oracular response. It is also possible that the tablet represents a previously unattested cult of Apollo with Orphic or Pythagorean connections, because it was found on tablets often connected with these mysteries. At Didyma, there was held the Didymaea, 
an annual festival with athletic and musical contests to honor Apollo's birthday, very similar to the Delhi at Delos. It was under the auspices of Miletus until it was made a Pan-Hellenic festival in the beginning of the 2nd century BC. There was also the Anoigmoi festival that celebrated annually the opening of every oracular period. The highly prosperous operations of Didyma came to an abrupt end in 494-493 BC though, when the Persian king Darius captured Miletus. The sanctuary was pillaged and burned, the bronze statue of Apollo was carried away to Ecbatana, and the Brancidae were deported according to the usual Persian policy of resettling war captives far away from home. It was reported that the spring dried up and the oracle was silenced. After about 150 years of silence, the oracle was revived in 334 BC, when Alexander the Great took the city. Callisthenes, a court historian of Alexander, reported that the spring began once more to flow after Alexander passed through, and Alexander reconsecrated the oracle and placed its administration in the hands of the city, where the priest in charge was annually elected. Alexander is said to have discovered the descendants of the Brancidae when he arrived in Bactria, but instead of restoring them to their ancient role, he cruelly slaughtered them. About 300 BC, Alexander's successor in the east and founder of the Seleucid Empire, Seleucus I Nicator, brought the bronze cult image of Apollo from Ecbatana back to Didyma. He also exported the cult of Apollo Didymaeus to the territory of Sogdiana, whose inscribed altars were seen and reported by correspondence with the Roman statesman Pliny the Younger. The Milesians began to build a new temple, which, if it had ever been completed, would have been the largest in the Hellenic world. We will discuss this temple in a future episode on Hellenistic architecture. Another famous oracular sanctuary of Apollo on the coast of Ionia was Kleros, located 12 kilometers to the north in the territory of Colophon. It was a very important center of prophecy, next to only Delphi and Didyma, and games called the Claria were held there every fifth year in honor of Apollo. It is unknown when the sanctuary was founded exactly, as its origins are shrouded in mythology. The founding myth of Kleros connects the city with the myth of the Epigoni who conquered Thebes. The two seers, the aforementioned Tiresias and his daughter Manto, became their captives along with other Thebans. The Epigoni sent them to Delphi to honor Apollo, but Tiresias died on the journey, as we mentioned earlier. At Delphi, Manto was commanded by Apollo to sell Tyonia with the remaining Thebans to found a colony there. When they arrived at the site where Kleros would later be founded, they were seized by armed Cretans under Rachius, the Cretan settler of Caria. After learning from Manto who they were and why they had come, Rachius married her and allowed the Thebans to found Kleros. Their son was the aforementioned celebrated seer and diviner, Mopsus. Another Greek seer named Caucus, a participant in the Trojan War, was said to have died at Kleros, as we discussed earlier. And so the origin of the oracle at Kleros was remembered by Greeks of the classical period as Bronze Age in origin. Archaeological investigations do lend some support to its mythic foundations. In Kleros itself, deep exploratory trenches dug between the altar and the temple facade have revealed proto-geometric pottery dating to the 10th century BC, and at Colophon, a Mycenaean era tomb has been found, but the presence of Mycenaean pottery is uncertain. Excavations at Kleros have demonstrated that there was a religious area there around a spring of fresh water from the 9th century BC onwards. The first known construction is a round altar of the second half of the 7th century BC. It was covered over at some point in the middle of the 6th century BC by a large rectangular altar. At the same time, a marble temple was built for Apollo around the spring while Apollo's sister, Artemis, had her own precinct and a smaller altar. Next to it were found the bases of two cori, one of which is preserved. The head is missing. There were at least four statues of Kuroi dedicated to Apollo. Three of them, which are incomplete, have been found. Very few changes occurred in the sanctuary between the 6th and the end of the 4th century BC, though. At that time, a new layout of the sacred area was conceived, with monuments on a larger scale. We will also talk about the site of Kleros more when we cover the Hellenistic period. Despite all of these sites that proclaimed to be giving the will of Apollo, there of course were doubters. As we discussed in episode 20, Xenophanes of Colophon and Ionia complained, quote, Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods all those actions that are shameful and blameworthy among men, 
stealing, adultery, and deception of each other, end quote. He pointed out that men make gods in their own image, saying that, quote, the Ethiopians say their gods are snub-nosed and black, while the Thracians think theirs are blue-eyed and red-haired, end quote. And that, quote, if cattle and horses and lions had hands and could draw and make things like men, horses would draw their gods in the shape of horses, and cattle theirs in the shape of cattle, end quote. Lucian, a later novelist and a writer of science fiction, one of whose books is called Voyage to the Moon, laughed at the traditional ideas about the gods in a comic speech he puts into the mouth of Zeus. Quote, Apollo, too, has taken on a dreadful job. He is practically deafened by people disturbing him with demands for prophecies. One minute he has to be in Delphi, the next he rushes over to Colophon, goes on from there to Xanthos, then off to full speed to Delos or Didyma. In fact, whatever the priestess, after drinking from the holy spring and chewing laurel leaves, writhes about on her tripod and calls on him to appear, he must immediately and with no delay present himself and spin out oracles or disgrace the whole profession. End quote. Furthermore, Euripides too doubted whether any god could have ordered a son to kill his mother, as according to the myth, Apollo did to Orestes. Solon too wrote that no divination by birds or sacrificial offering would ever ward off what is destined to be. But these were the doubts of a relatively few writers and poets. They were probably shared by other educated people who turned to philosophy for an understanding of the universe and man's place in it. But gods and oracles, mysteries, and omens went on in the ordinary people's belief and were absorbed by the Romans into their religious thought. On the next episode, we turn our attention fully to Apollo, who was not only a god of prophecy, but has been variously recognized as a god of music, truth, knowledge, healing, the sun and light, medicine and plague, poetry, and much more. He was one of the most widely worshipped deities in the Greek world, and he's the last deity whose cult, myths, and iconography we have yet to discuss for the classical period. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 81, The Leader of the Muses. 